Hey guys, um, my name's Ryan Reed. I'm one of the historic interpreters here at Bennett Place State Historic Site. Uh, and we're gonna share, you this, share the story of uh, the surrender at Bennett Place and the, would ultimately become the largest of the war. General Johnston would surrender to General Sherman, 89,270 Confederate soldiers and sailors and four Confederate states, North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Now, the reason they ultimately meet at Bennett Place is you kind of have to understand how or what's going on with the armies. Johnston, after the Battle of Bentonville, he doesn't successfully stop Sherman's uh, movement through North Carolina. He retreats to Smithfield, North Carolina, reorganizes his army a little bit, makes them more functional, uh, and then starts moving them to Raleigh, and then ultimately goes straight through the city of Raleigh with the ultimate goal of Greensboro, North Carolina. Greensboro is where he's hoping Lee's army, who's uh, going through Southern Virginia at the Appomattox campaign, He's hoping that he will meet up with Lee's Army of Northern Virginia in Greensboro. Now, as uh, Johnston's army is moving through the Piedmont, the Durham area, and, and, and heading towards Greensboro, he's starting to get wind of something's going on. Lee has surrendered, uh, but he's not quite clear on whether or not that's the case. So ultimately, he gets to, or gets to Greensboro, and he gets the news that Lee has surrendered. Lee will surrender on April 9th, 1865, approximately 27,000 men of the Army of Northern Virginia. This leaves Johnston in quite a situation. He was hoping for the reinforcements of Lee's men. They were going to join forces and collectively try to fight either Sherman's army and then Grant's army. It was kind of a Hail Mary pass. Can't really see it working out, but that's what they were gonna try to do. But Johnston has about 30,000 men, what's left of the Army of Tennessee. He understands in Greensboro, he, he now understands what he's facing here in North Carolina with Sherman's forces. He's seen at Bentonville. And he knows that after Bentonville, Sherman's forces have done nothing but gotten larger and stronger. They, they're, more, they're better equipped than they were at, at Bentonville. And his army's not. They have food and they have some ammunition. They have a fight. If they had to, have, if they had to fight, they could. But he knew which way the wind was blowing. And what Situation Appomattox really struck to him was these paroles. Um, Appomattox before then, Confederate soldiers really didn't know what their fate was gonna be if they surrendered. Were they gonna go to prison or war camps or be hung as traitors? But something will unfold at, uh, at Appomattox in those paroles, which is a simple piece of paper that says, go home. These soldiers were told to go home. As long as you act like you have some sense, nothing will be said to you by the federal government ever again. And that's, amazing. It's unheard of in world history as far as civil wars are, uh, are concerned. So Johnston realizes he has an opportunity to save lives. So he gets the, he convinces Jefferson Davis, who's also in Greensboro as well, to allow him to open up talks with Sherman. Now Sherman at this point, he had resupplied and gotten more men in Goldsboro, North Carolina after the Battle of Bentonville and almost immediately moved into Raleigh on April 13th after the uh, city surrendered. Sherman is in and around the city of Raleigh. And his, at this point, his forward line is around the city or the town of uh, Durham Station, North Carolina. Now Durham, there is no city of Durham. Uh, there is no county of Durham. It's nothing but a small trading station with about a hundred residents around it. Uh, and in fact, if you know where the uh, Durham Bulls uh, baseball park is today, historically, that's where the train station would have been. And that's Sherman's forward line. Now, Johnson, again, is situated in Greensboro and his rear line, his rear guard are gonna be in Hillsboro. Uh, now, Hillsboro hasn't moved in a couple hundred years. That's basically about the same spot. So Johnston opens up negotiations with Sherman and says, let's meet somewhere between our lines. And again, that's between basically Hillsboro and downtown Durham historically today. And Wade Hampton, who is Johnston's cavalry commander, uh, suggests the meet along the old Hillsboro Road. And this road, again, a portion of it still remains here on, uh, on site at Bennett Place. It's one of the last portions of the historic road left. Uh, it was the I-40 of its day. It was a wide two-lane road where it stretched the populated portion of the state going all the way to coast and all the way to what's now Winston-Salem, heavily used for trade and commerce and during time of war troop movement. Johnson had just used that road days before to move an entire core of his army west as they were heading into Hillsboro and then Greensboro. So Johnston and Sherman agree to meet somewhere between their lines on April 17th, 1865. It was a Monday. 
Uh, April 16th was Easter Sunday, and I feel as uh, Sherman, being a good Catholic, didn't want to do any business on Easter, so they decided to move it to Monday. Um, so they they meet, they decide to start marching around 10 a.m., and wherever they run into each other, they figure out a meeting spot. Now, they never chose to meet here at the Bennett Farm. Again, the Bennett Farm wasn't on any map. They didn't say, let's see what James and Nancy would allow us to do. But Johnston and about 50 armed cavalry troopers of the 5th South Carolina Cavalry and Wade Hampton, his cavalry commander, will start marching from Hillsboro, North Carolina, and headed east and we're looking for Sherman and his entourage. Now, Sherman has a little bit more of a ride. Sherman's going to start off in Raleigh, where his headquarters are, um, and he's going to get to the train station and would uh, get from the train station up to Durham Station, where his cavalry commander, uh, Justin Kilpatrick, is waiting with about 150 armed cavalry troopers in the 9th Pennsylvania. Now, these guys are going to come with armed cavalry troopers. There's still an active campaign going on here in North Carolina, even though Appomattox has happened. Not a lot has, has changed here as far as these guys are still firing at one another if they see each other. So that first day, they're going to come with bodyguards, armed cavalrymen. And that first day is going to be probably the largest contingent of force, almost 300 cavalrymen uh, here on the farm, along with Sherman and his staff and Johnson and his staff. They're going to be the ones doing the paperwork. And uh, Sherman, right before he gets on the train, something is going to happen in, in Raleigh. Something's going to happen that's going to change the entire atmosphere of the surrender. And it would make a great scene in a movie. If Sherman, as Sherman was getting on the train in Raleigh, a telegraph operator runs out of his office and basically says, General, General, there's an encoded message coming in from Washington, Washington, D.C., or Washington City then. And Sherman runs up to his office and waits for the code, or the, the message to be decoded. And lo and behold, it's Sherman being notified of Lincoln's assassination. To kind of give you an idea how fresh this news is for the country, Lincoln shot on the 14th of April. He'll die early in the morning on the 15th, around 8 o'clock in the morning. And Easter Sunday is April 16th. And he's getting on a train to go talk with Johnson on April 17th. So Sherman realizes, oh, this is going to change things. So he swears the telegraph operator to secrecy, folds that piece of paper up, puts it in his inside jacket pocket, and gets on the train. Now, the reason he doesn't tell anybody until he meets one-on-one -on -one with Johnston is because he had made a promise to Raleigh that he would it would be a peaceful occupation. He was not going to destroy cities or destroy Raleigh as he had done to say Columbia and Atlanta uh, because they surrendered. And that was kind of the deal. You know, lay down arms and I'll share my last cracker with you kind of thing. And to be good to his word, he knew he had 100,000, almost 100,000 federal troops in and around the capital city of Raleigh. That if that news had gotten out that Lincoln had been assassinated, yeah, Raleigh would have been gone. These guys would have been walked in with torches and burned the city to the ground. So he swears the telegraph operator to secrecy and gets on the train. He gets to Durham Station, hooks up with his cavalry entourage, again, telling nobody there, the generals and colonels and everybody included in the, in the ride, and starts marching west. Johnson and his entourage would pass the, what, the, the Bennett House, and about a quarter mile past the Bennett House, they would run into Sherman's men. Now, Sherman and Johnston immediately recognize one another. They kind of tip their hats, <clears throat> and Sherman had, poses a very kind of strange request. And he's asked, he asked Johnston, did you see somewhere that we could meet one-on-one? -on -one? That's kind of probably confused Johnston a little bit because they could easily set up tables, talk under a giant oak tree and start hashing out the Appomattox terms just for the armies here. And that was kind of the initial idea. But Sherman knows that Lincoln's assassination is going to change what they possibly could do or can do. So Johnston says, yes, having just passed the Bennett home, it's a large, substantial structure, uh, or it's a modest size structure. I don't say it's large, but it's right off the road. So he suggests, let's turn around and see if the locals will let us use their home uh, for the part or for the negotiations. So a little afternoon on April 17th, 1865, James and Nancy Bennett, yeoman farmers, these gentlemen, the, the, the family is are non-slave owning uh, farmers. They work the land themselves. They have approximately 189 acres. Uh, which is a large chunk of land to work themselves. And we're not clear on exactly uh, how much they're working or exactly what they're doing. Uh, I always joke that every April, we always have more uh, people say, well, 
if you could time travel, would you have more questions for the generals or the Bennett's? And most of the staff and volunteer here have more questions for the Bennett's because they didn't write anything down. The generals wrote what they did down. But a little bit afternoon, on April 17th, James sees these two generals with a large entourage of men in blue and gray marching side by side, coming up the road and the two generals jump off, stand in front of the, the gate and simply ask James permission to use their parlor. They don't kick the door down. They don't say, get out. They actually do ask permission. Uh, now, whether or not the Bennett's could have said no, I don't know. Uh, but again, they do make it a friendly engagement. They don't wanna be hostile. This is a peace negotiation. They're gonna start it out with peaceful uh, rhetoric. But also on the Bennett side, they'd lost both of their sons, their son-in-law during the time of the war, one son and their son-in-law um, of the war uh, in service of the Confederacy and uh, one died here on the farm. So they've lost enough. And if these two generals are at their front door simply asking to use their home for a few hours to end all of this, I could see both Nancy and James going, yeah, come on in. So, James, or so after James gives them permission, um, the generals walk into the parlor close the door one-on-one -on -one and start talking. Again, they, they want to start one-on-one -on -one because Sherman has to tell Johnson about Lincoln's assassination and they don't want anyone else around. Uh, Johnson's the only person that needs to know this information as of right now. So that Sherman takes out that telegraph, gives it to Johnston and waits for his reaction. And uh, Johnston reads this and it was said that beads of sweat rolled down his forehead and he just looks appalled. He knew he knew that Lincoln's plan for peaceful unification, especially what came out of Appomattox, Lincoln was the best friend the, the, the South had at that point. And without Lincoln at the helm running the federal government, there were many people screaming for retribution, punishment, hanging of the leadership. Uh, and that was against everything Lincoln wanted uh, for the end of the war. And, you know, there's a famous meeting between Grant, Sherman, and Admiral Porter. And these are the top commanders, you know, number one and number two on land and Admiral of his Navy. Lincoln had called them for a meeting in City Point, Virginia to lay out the end of the war because he knew that the war was gonna come to an end somewhere within his four years of his second term. And then he lays out this idea for let them up easy. And you know, Grant and Sherman kind of questioned, they were like, well, what about this idea of retribution punishment, this four years of horrible, horrible war that's taken a toll on everybody. And Lincoln responds with, has there not been enough death already? Who am I to add to it? So Sherman had heard those words directly from Lincoln and he's coming with that passion to end this war with as kind of terms as possible. And with Lincoln's idea of peaceful unification in mind, he comes here with, to Johnston and tries to fulfill that. And Johnston and Sherman, after kind of getting over the news of Lincoln's death, they go, now what? Well, they immediately agree to call, to, to call a timeout, a truce. The armies aren't to move from where they are right now to prevent any sort of accidental firing, uh, friendly fire, that type of thing. So that's, that's simple. That's done. The armies are to pause until they come up with an agreement. And then they say, well, what are we going to do? Now, we know what the Lincoln wanted for the military, and that was those paroles, just simply let them go home. Um, you know, if they can, as Lee says to his men, and Johnson says something very similar is, if you can be as good as soldiers as, uh, or citizens as you were soldiers, we're gonna be okay. So this idea of just letting them go and go back home, that was pretty clear. Johnson and Sherman were pretty clear on that, but they said, why don't we go a little bigger and try to end this war in one document? And they agree that they need to go back to the headquarters, talk it over, figure out some terms, and then they'll come back, on the, uh, come back the next day on April 18th. So after a few hours of negotiating, getting on the same page with, with where the negotiations are gonna go, they leave the farmhouse, they don't stay overnight. And Johnston goes back to Hillsboro and uh, Sherman back to Raleigh. And when Johnston gets back to Hillsboro, he's at the Alexander Dixon Plantation, um, <clears throat> which still exists in downtown Hillsboro today. It was moved across the highway in the eighties from its original location, which is now Walmart, but hey, the building still exists. But he was using that as a headquarters and um, John C. Breckinridge, who's the uh, Secretary of War, 
and John Reagan, the Postmaster General uh, of the Confederacy, had actually been sent by Jefferson Davis, who's now on the run to Charlotte because he's trying to get out of the way of federal uh, forces. They were here to kind of help him flesh out terms. And that's what Johnson's going to do the night of the 17th and all the way into the early mornings of April 18th. And he's going to come with terms. Sherman's doing the same in Raleigh. And they'll meet back at Bennett Place on April 18th, 1865. Again, a little afternoon is what we're kind of guessing. The Bennett's know they're coming this time, so it's no surprise. And they welcome him in for a second day of negotiation. And they hash out what we call the initial surrender term. And this document is very extensive. It's massive. It ends the war in one piece of paper, in one document. They call it Peace from the Potomac to the Rio Grande. Johnston uh, agrees to surrender not only the Confederate troops here in North Carolina, the Army of Tennessee, which is essentially what Lee would do in um, Virginia with his Army of Northern Virginia, but all Confederate troops left in the field. And that means everyone from Texas out west down to Florida, everybody. Johnson thought he could pull this off because he was the highest ranking commander left in the field. After Lee surrenders, Lee being number one, Johnston was effectively number two, much like Grant's number one, Lee Sherman's number two for the Federals. Now Johnston is number one. Lee's gone. So Johnston is the highest ranking field commander. He is, he's got the respect of the men and he thought he could get that done. So all that settles the military portion of it. But the uh, initial surrender term also delves in political matters. So they try to answer questions that Lincoln himself had not quite answered yet. And it reestablishes judicial systems in the South, it reestablishes state governments, Basically, everyone who's running the show now from uh, local sheriffs to uh, state legislatures and all the southern states that had seceded would be folded into the federal government overnight to continue a continuity of government. It also protects property rights for Southerners. Uh, again, it brings all the South back into the fold overnight. And again, they think they have just ended the war from Potomac to the Rio Grande, and they think they've done it. They, they, they have fulfilled Lincoln's wish for peaceful unification. And in that day, uh, along with Sherman's entourage, a man by the name of Theodore Davis would be with him. He's a sketch artist from Harper's Weekly. And during the morning hours where Johnson and Sherman were uh, hashing out that initial surrender term, he had been actually sketching the outside of the house. And I, I have a picture of it right here on April 18th, 1865. Uh, it's the sketch that Davis would do of the outside of the house. And then on the uh, later that day, once they had signed the initial surrender term and it was being copied, Sherman suggested before we leave, he looks to Johnston and says, hey, would you like to get a sketch done for posterity um, to put in the newspaper? You know, why not? And well, that's where we get this sketch right here. So a little after the negotiations, Sherman uh, Theodore Davis comes into the parlor of James and Nancy Bennett and sketches a, a kind of a stage photo, because Sherman and Johnson aren't just the only ones in there. Uh, there would have been multitude of colonels, lieutenants doing the paperwork. But once all of that was done, they straightened up the parlor and gave us the only interior shot of the uh, farmhouse we have. So this is a very important photo, uh, not only for uh, posterity, but for us here at the Bennett Farm, uh, so we know exactly what the Bennett house looked like. Now, there, uh, once the sketches were done, the papers were sent off. They went back to their headquarters and waited for the uh, Congress to approve it uh, and see what they go from there. So they're still pausing. And Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, loves the surrender term. These, this document gives everything to the South. I mean, it is the sweetest deal possible. But as you can probably imagine, Congress is not so happy. When this document gets to Washington, Congress is outraged. It gives far, much, far too much to the South. Uh, it, it's, it over, it, uh, Sherman is overstepping his boundaries. Or they, they actually infer that as a military commander, how can you delve in political matters? That's kind of Congress's job. Uh, they even call Sherman a traitor and think it gets, it gets very wild, very fast in Washington. They call Sherman a traitor, think that he's taking money from the Confederate treasury to give such kind terms to the South, all this wild stuff and the headlines of newspapers all in the North. Uh, so Congress will promptly reject it. And there are major problems with it, and there were problems with the initial surrender term. Uh, when you think about how it would have been applied during the years of Reconstruction is, uh, the big one is I talked that it, it basically folded in the Confederate governments 
into the federal government or federal authority and body overnight. So you essentially have a Confederate state legislature, let's take, for example, here in North Carolina, which would have been voted on during the war by Southerners or Confederate, you know, they would have been now in charge of the federal government. And now they'd have to be dealing with the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 5th. Are you going to see that this is not going to really flesh out very well? Uh, you're going to have kind of the same problems you would have in 1861. It was too much. It was too fast. Um, and the biggest problem in that initial surrender term was there's a clause that talked about uh, the political rights um, as well as the rights of person and property uh, would be reestablished. Uh, they protected property rights for Southerners. Uh, now, that doesn't sound too bad when we think about it in the 21st century, but we're talking about the mid 19th century, slaves were considered property. Now, I know you're saying the Emancipation Proclamation had happened by this point, even the 13th Amendment had been ratified by this point. Yes, but not by all northern states by April of 1865, and sure as heck by not any southern states. The 11, former, or 11 states of the former Confederacy had not ratified the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. So this document could easily maybe confuse the issue of abolition. Could the southern plantation owners sue for the property, i.e. slaves they lost under the 13th Amendment? You see the problem. It's too much. It's too fast. Now, you're probably saying Sherman was, wrote that in knowing about the problem it could have in the post-war years. But Sherman and Johnson later on in, in memoirs and in letters and when asked about it, they said they were in that room. And when they wrote that stipulation and, and that clause in the initial surrender term, they talk about the initial uh, property rights. They basically kind of pause and look around to everyone in the room going, you know, we mean property basically as we define it today. You know, Sherman knew the 13th Amendment was a done deal. Slavery was over. And so did Johnston. That was a done deal. They just knew it was. But that's not exactly how it would have fleshed out in reality. So it's promptly rejected. So what does Congress do? Congress sends the only person that could tell Sherman what to do uh, down to Raleigh. And that's General Ulysses S. Grant. Grant comes to Raleigh. And this is around... April 24th, 25th, um, or excuse me, 23rd. And uh, he knocks on the door of Sherman's headquarters and Sherman opens the door and there's his boss. And the only person that can tell him what to do is now standing at his front door. And Sherman and Grant have a sit down and basically come to Jesus moment. And Grant looks at, to Sherman and says, you know, William, I know what you're trying to do. He does understand, um, but and also gives Sherman the realization of what's going on um, in Washington. They're furious uh, and we need to do something else. Well, in reality, Congress actually sent Grant there to kick Sherman out of command. They want Sherman out. Grant's gonna take over command of Sherman's forces and actually pursue Johnston into a fight somewhere here in the Carolinas in the Piedmont region if Johnston doesn't want to surrender. So you have to kind of imagine almost two weeks after Appomattox, you still have the federal government in Washington kind of almost painting the federal forces here in North Carolina into another fight somewhere. And Grant comes down here and it's like, well, we're not doing that. And he says, you have to meet with him again. You have to figure it out. He leaves Sherman in command. He doesn't even want the armies to know he's here. Or Grant's here because they'll make a big deal about it. He just wants Sherman, who knows Johnston, to... to figure out, you know him, I'm not gonna interject myself in the situation, which was a brilliant move on his part <clears throat> because if Grant would have shown up, who knows what that would have done. She, you know, Sherman and uh, Johnston at this point know one another, they have a rapport. It was a very smart move, leadership move on Grant's part to allow Sherman to continue the negotiations, but understanding that it needs to be a military term like he gave to Lee at Appomattox. Now, what <clears throat> some historians will say is, that why didn't Grant know, or why didn't Lee, hold on, a lot of generals floating around right now. Why didn't Sherman know about Grant's telegraph from Lincoln? Lincoln had actually telegraphed uh, Grant and said, right before Appomattox, they were like, if you get in contact with Lee and negotiate, do it under military terms. Basically, Lincoln is giving Grant some parameters in his terms because he knows if they accidentally go into political matters, that could be problematic, and that's gonna be in Congress. Now, 
Sherman doesn't get that message. He did not get that memo. When he meets here, he is uh, basically trying to do the best he thought, what he thought Lincoln wanted to do. And that's what he did. He was not out of any sort of malicious uh, intent. He was simply trying to end the war um, and be as kind to the Southerners as he thought Lincoln would have wanted. And obviously it's too much. So that's what's going on on the federal side. And almost at the same time, so Sherman sends a telegraph to Johnston saying, hey, we need to meet again. So let's move over to Greensboro. At this point, Jefferson Davis is excited, had been excited about the initial surrender term, but they're waiting on the federals um, to accept it. And about on the, on the same day, April 23rd, Johnston uh, receives a telegraph from Jefferson Davis saying, congratulations. Um, oh no, sorry, on April 23rd, after hearing of the initial surrender term being rejected, Jefferson Davis sends a telegraph to Johnston, who's now order, ordering jo Johnston, since they don't want the initial surrender term, move your army south to Charlotte. So during this time period, the news had gotten out. Jefferson Davis does know he's happy about the initial surrender term, but now that it's rejected, he wants to fight as well. Jeff Davis, who's in Charlotte, wants Johnson's army to move south to Charlotte, and possibly even go by rail to what's now New Mexico and Arizona and continue to fight for the Southern Confederacy. Johnston on the same day gets a telegraph saying, move your army south to Charlotte, but then not a little while later, gets a telegraph from Sherman saying, hey, let's meet for a third day. Let's meet again, let's renegotiate. Well, Johnston looks at this and simply says, yeah, to heck with Jeff Davis. He disobeys direct orders from his commander in chief and agrees to meet with Sherman for a third and final day on April 26th, 1865. And again, the Bennett's not knowing at this point, uh, they thought that they had served their duty and allowed them to use the parlor for the two days, see the two generals riding down the road again. And uh, I guess at this point they're like, so what's up? <laughs> well, the generals asked to use it for one more day. <clears throat> and again, the Bennett's still wanting this war to be over, let them on in. And for a few hours, they figure out what went wrong, what they need to take away, which is that whole political section of the initial surrender term. And then they focus just in on the military terms, which weren't problematic, but the scope of it, the initial one was all Confederate forces left in the field. Johnston says, well, what if I do my military department? And early in 1865, Johnston had been given commander of the military department of North and South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So those four states are under his direct command. So that's what they agree on to surrender. All Confederate forces in those four states under Johnson's direct command will equal 89,270 Confederate soldiers and sailors. Again, making this by far the largest of the war. So when they leave that home on April 26th, they, they know they've made a big step towards uh, peace. And they've done everything that they can. Uh, and over the course of the next few weeks, Johnson and uh, Sherman, well, Johnston would leave an army here to help Johnston with the surrender, the Army of the Ohio under Schofield's command. And Johnston will go back to Greensboro and start figuring out a way uh, to send his, uh, or to give his men paroles. And they do kind of the same thing they did at Appomattox. They take over a printing press and start printing out paroles. And I have a copy of one of the paroles here. And it's just a very simple document, not nearly as fancy as the one in Appomattox, but it just tells who the soldier is, uh, what their rank is, and where home is. And this document allows them free travel back home. A uh, very important piece of paper. So over the next few weeks, the soldiers will uh, lay down their arms. There's no fancy parade like at Appomattox. Uh, the armies are three days march between each other. And almost immediately after the surrender on April 26th, Johnson or Sherman's forces, about 60,000 of them, these are the guys he marched through the South with, fought at Bentonville with. He's going to start marching north to go to the Grain Review in Washington, D.C. So, Schofield's Army of the Ohio, 30,000 plus men, are left here to kind of do a police state of North Carolina. And that's going to take a little bit. And so, about a month or so, all the Confederate troops in and around Greensboro and High Point and what will receive their paroles. Uh, they'll be paroled by their own commanders. There's Confederates paroling com Confederates in Greensboro. There's no Confederal troops for, for several days or weeks. Uh, and they'll lay down their, their muskets and cartridge boxes and 
Uh, not all the flags, a lot of the battle flags, again, unlike at Appomattox, you don't have any federal troops looking at you. You have to roll them up and stack them. They actually, several of them get ripped off poles, shoved into jackets and taken back to their home state. And years later are donated to those state archives. And there's several great examples of uh, flags uh, throughout the South that were surrendered or units that were surrendered here in Greensboro. And uh, ultimately, about a month or so in, you're going to have all 89,000 men uh, get news of the surrender, but it's going to take a little bit for all 89,000 men uh, to get pearls. I mean, you're talking troops in four states, all the way down to Florida, uh, which isn't nearly as populous as it was today. It's basically just the panhandle. Uh, so eventually, all these men are going to go home, and it becomes the largest of the war, three times larger than what happens at Appomattox. And then I guess at this, this point in the tour, if I was in the house, I would say, well, so what? You know, okay. 89,000 men go home. Well, boots on the ground in April of 1865. What you see the news of the extent and the, the, the scale of the surrender here at Bennett Place and what it does, it drastically changes the tone of the Confederate commanders still left in the field. The greatest example is Lieutenant General Richard Taylor. He's the son of Zachary Taylor, former president. He'll be the next one to surrender in Citronelle, Alabama. And he actually writes a, a letter to his men after hearing about Appomattox saying guy is kind of like a pep talk. He says, boys, yes, the rumors are true, but Johnston is still in the field. His command is still in the field. We might have to fight our way to him to help him here in North Carolina. They're down in Alabama and Mississippi. Or we might have to protect him if, if Johnston comes here. There's still a fight to be fought. So many commanders, even though Appomattox was a, was a, was a blow, uh, they still thought, there was a chance, there was something they could do, however grim it might have looked. But once Johnson signs away those 89,000 uh, Confederate troops in four Confederate states, Richard Taylor has a drastically different tone. He sends out a letter to his men and basically says, Johnson has surrendered as well. It's time to go home. And he tells his men he's going to seek out his federal counterpart, who ends up being General, General Canby, and he'll he'll surrender his troops a couple of weeks later in mid-May. Bennett Place, I like to say, solidifies what we think Appomattox does. Everyone says Appomattox is the end. Well, it's only the end because Johnson chose to continue the talks of peace here. Uh, so I like to say it's a big history in a small house. It's um, a turning point in American history. Uh, the surrender at Bennett Place, it's the moment in which our country can finally take a breath and North and South, people in the North and South can finally look at their neighbor and go, the war's over. Such a large amount of men and such a large amount of territory. This is when people know it's over. They don't know what the future holds, but they know the bloodshed will stop. The war is gone. A war that will cost 650,000 American lives. That's a conservative number. The numbers range, but even with that, uh, that would be millions in today's population. You know, it was 2% of the population then. Everyone knew someone that died or was wounded from this war. And uh, the governments were still wanting to fight. Like I, I kind of paint the image that even as these generals are meeting for that third day and coming up with a surrender term, the government in Washington and Jeff Davis's government on the run are still trying to egg these men on into fighting somewhere. And, you know, instead of that, those two generals, Sherman and Johnston, chieftains of war, lifelong military men, both West Pointers, decide to say no. And they come back to the small log cabin in the middle of nowhere, Orange County, and make peace. It's the largest step for unification the country would take after four of its bloodiest years. So again, in a place, big history, a small house. So I hope that kind of gave you a good overview and a good feel of all the things that took place here at Bennett Place. It's, it's, a, it's a lot going on. A lot of things are happening at the same time. It's, uh, it's chaotic, it's nationwide what's going on. Uh, but yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it gave you an insight and you know, hope encourage you to come on out to Bennett Place uh, and see the, see the farm for yourself. Now, before we uh, wrap up, I did wanna kind of give you on a couple of reading suggestions. I have a few books. The first one um, is gonna be uh, This Astounding Close, The Road to Bennett Place by Mark Bradley. This one's a really good book. Uh, this one talks about the Carolinas campaign as a whole. So Bennett Place shares a function in it, but it talks about all the battles that will take place. The ones you've probably been hearing about, the movements uh, through some of these other talks. 
Uh, but again, it kind of shows you what all these generals are dealing with uh, during the Carolinas campaign. Another one that's really good uh, is called To the Bitter End. Uh, it's Appomattox, Bennett Place, and the Surrenders of the Confederacy by Robert M. Dunkerley. Uh, this one is really fascinating because uh, Robert, he actually went uh, into not only the big ones, the big five that we always talk about, but also the other surrenders that take place in between by units and certain artillery. It's crazy stories. Uh, again, the day before Facebook and text message, uh, <clears throat> these guys don't get the news the war's over if you're on some distant outpost patrol. You know, you might not be associated with the larger armies that surrendered it at Appomattox, Bentonville, or Bennett Place, excuse me, and then Citronelle and the others. And it talks about how all the boys ended up going home. So fascinating read on that one. And our last one, one of the newer ones that's really cool, is uh, We Ride a Whirlwind by Eric J. Wittenberg. This one is cool because a lot of times Bennett Place is just a component in a book you know, it talks about the Carolinas campaign and then we're we're attached at the end or we talk about the surrenders and how Appomattox will influence what happens here what Eric does is he takes just what happens here and talks about the nuts and bolts and the interpersonal relationships and the dynamics and what the thought process was uh, and a lot again very fascinating solely about Bennett Place um, in a historic context and a historic in book so again another great read if you want to dive into the interesting story uh, that happened here at Bennett Place.